Hello, hi, and welcome. It's me, Nalifa Hidayat, the host of the show that you are watching right now, Dear World Live, wherever you're streaming this, whether it's on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, you are more than welcome. Thank you for joining us. Now, each week on Dear World Live, we bring you one important issue and one aspect of our lives and our planet that's been changed as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. We are on lockdown, wherever in the world it is that you're watching this. Um, this is, it's isolation, but we're isolated together. So we're making the best of what we've got. With the show I have coming up for you, I know you're gonna be really excited to see all of the people and all the guests that we have. Now in today's program, we will be talking about uh, the community of people with disabilities and the impact of the coronavirus. Now, I wanna show you this photo um, that I saw earlier this week. One of the main things that we are taught in terms of doing our civic duty to stop the spread of the coronavirus is to wash our hand. But the way the world is currently designed, the way the barriers are in place, even that is made difficult for some disabled people. Now, the community of people with disabilities is a broad and diverse one, covering physical disabilities, learning disabilities, emotional and psychological ones, just to name a few. And today, my two guests will be talking about their specific experiences and what they're doing to change the world for the better. I mean, it's no small feat. Uh, of course, we will be talking about the impact that they will be having and how they have risen to the challenges presented to them but also, hopefully, we, you and I, can come away with a sense of what we can do to try and make the world a better place. Okay, remember, I am always here to hear from you. Thank you so much for those of you who are joining. Um, I'm excited for the conversation too. Um, and you can get in touch with us. The easiest way is to just drop a comment wherever it is you are watching us. Make sure you use the hashtag Dear World. I wanna know what you think about the conversation as we go ahead and have it. If you have any comments, any questions, any thoughts, any experiences that you wanna share, please do. I wanna hear from you. Also, this is supposed to be a global conversation. So tell me where you are watching us right now. Wherever you're based, uh, drop a little comment to tell me where you're watching. I always love seeing those. And we will try and feature as many of your comments and questions as we can. Okay, time to introduce all of our amazing guests. Today, I will be joined by Baroness Tani Gray Thompson, a Paralympic athlete competing in five Paralympic Games. She now sits in the House of Lords uh, as a cross peer, uh, cross bench peer. She is a social welfare and a disability rights advocate and raises those issues in the British Parliament constantly. I'm also joined by Maysoon Zaid, a comedian, a writer and a disability rights activist. She co-founded the New York Arab American Comedy Festival and in fact, I, I found this out recently, has the most viewed TED Talk of 2014. And in her tons of spare time, <laughs> she's also <laughs> written a best-selling memoir titled Find Another Dream. And finally, my friend, a friend of Doha Debates and someone who's been on our shows previously, Nawal Akram. Nawal is based in Doha, Qatar. She is also a, a, a campaigner, a comedian, focusing on the rights to education and access to education for people with disabilities. Thank you all for joining me. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you. I'm so excited that this is an all woman panel. That was <laughs> never <laughs> happens to me, never. I know, right? So listen, we are joined Bring by it. many people from Istanbul, uh, in Turkey, people are watching from the Philippines, um, uh, from Qatar as well. Sharif, you are welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we got fans of some of you already on the line, so that's really good. Remember, guys, to send in your comments and your questions. But now to crack on with the show. Uh, Baroness Gray Thompson, tell me about the work that you did when you were an athlete, a Paralympian, um, within the, 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 the access and the rights of disabled people and the disabled community, and also how you've taken that on in your work in the House of Lords. Well, for me, when I started, because I'm 50 now, you know, nobody had heard of the Paralympics and um, I did track and road racing. And, you know, the questions I used to be asked were things like, you know, do you train? Yeah, quite a lot, actually. Or um, I remember somebody saying to me once that they thought the Paralympics was really unfair because didn't it depend on how fast the person was who was pushing you? 
You go, no, no, I pushed myself. So for me, that kind of athlete rights um, was really important. You know, athletes don't often get a lot of input or choice in, in what they do. So that then transferred into um, disability rights and welfare rights. And then when I finished as an athlete, I had the opportunity to go into the UK Parliament. And for me, it was really important to use that platform as an athlete to then, you know, keep fighting for rights. You know, one of the things you learn as an athlete is you find your voice. Yes. Um, and, and it's important for me to... Um, you know, not speak on behalf of other disabled people because they've got their own voices, but just to raise issues and, and help them have a voice to, to fight for equality. Because, you know, even in the UK, we're so much luckier than most disabled people around the world, but we, we don't have equality. And I think what the coronavirus has shown is that, you know, some of those things that we thought we did have are, are under threat. Absolutely. And May Soon, I want to bring you in at this point. You are a performer. You've worked with on numerous films uh, and been on numerous sets. You're a writer, a creator in, in so many ways. You've worked with Adam Sandler and launched entire comedy festivals. Talk to me about some of the ways that you were able to do that despite some of the barriers that were put in your way. So I was raised by parents who were very empowering. And I think I'm lucky because of that, because we know that worldwide people with disabilities often are not lucky enough to have parents that encourage them and let them take risks. I had parents that encouraged me. I had parents that fought to mainstream my education. The school wanted to send me to a special school and my parents fought to make sure I was mainstream. So they set me up to succeed. But I was also lucky and unlucky in that my dream was to be on television. And I didn't see people who looked like me on TV. In United States media, people with disabilities are only 2% of the images. 95% are played by non-disabled people. So I was up against a lot, but where I did see myself was the world of stand-up comedy. People like Richard Pryor, who were people of color, who also had disabilities. So I found my voice in stand-up comedy. I found success in stand-up comedy. And then it was easier to break into a media that shunned disabled people because I proved I could draw an audience and sell tickets. Absolutely. Now, let's get into things. Maysoon, I want to understand from you. Obviously, a lot of your gigs, a lot of your acting work being on set, almost all of that work is cancelled because of the coronavirus. And we know that unemployment, certainly in America, where, where you are, I imagine, is, is, is at astronomical levels. 26.5 million people registered unemployed as a result of the coronavirus. The numbers are really high in the UK and imaginably around the world. When it comes to the community of people with disabilities, how does the coronavirus, how does unemployment affect them? Right. So I may have been lucky because my shows were wiped off the slate on March 1st. So I knew much earlier than a lot of my fellow Americans that this was serious, this was real, and that I needed to self-isolate and shelter in place. Why? Because it's a double whammy. It's two times as difficult for disabled people dealing with COVID than it is for their non-disabled peers. First of all, we tend to be in that category known as medically vulnerable or having underlying conditions or things that make battling corona a lot more difficult than say someone with a full clean bill of health. And we know that corona kills anyone, healthy, unhealthy, disabled, old, young, but these underlying conditions, these pre-existing conditions do put us at a higher risk. The secondary problem is that accessing Healthcare in the United States as a disabled person is nightmarish. Often our symptoms are dismissed, especially when we're dealing with mental health issues. They think it's an anxiety attack instead of actually not being able to breathe. And there have been conversations worldwide about whether disabled lives are worth saving. Imagine what that does to the morale of our community when we hear that worldwide People are saying, don't give a vent to someone with cerebral palsy. Don't give a vent to someone with an intellectual disability. The assumption that we have a lower quality of life, that we are not worth saving, is really dangerous. It's very demoralizing. And honestly, it's terrifying. I'm going to come back to that, Maysoon. I have a specific thing I want to talk to you about. But but let's bring in Baroness Gray Thompson here again. A few days ago, you raised a question in the House of Lords about community deaths specifically. Mm -hmm. 
and the way that there is a problem with the way that the statistics with the rate of the death toll with coronavirus is being counted. Today, the Office of National Statistics in the United Kingdom has come forward, come forward with new numbers that substantially raise the death toll um, here in the United Kingdom. I want to understand from you, why was it important for you to raise that question? And also, why is it important to have these accurate numbers? I mean, I think early on it felt like we're in some kind of league table com competition. You know, as long as we came in under Spain and Italy, we'd be fine. And, you know, the deaths in hospitals were being reported, but not care homes and not community deaths. And I think it's important for several reasons, partly just so the public understands the severity of this issue. And, you know, it's it's bad. You know, it will kill lots and lots of people. Um, you know, I think if we come out of this with around 50,000 deaths, we'll have done okay if you if you can sort of say that um but for me um a lot of the community deaths I, I was worried were being ignored because a lot of disabled people wouldn't get as far as going into hospital and some of that was about trying to triage patients about trying to you know because hospitals aren't good places to be if you're sick if that makes sense because there's lots of other sick people there and if you're vulnerable if you have an underlying health condition there's a, a huge amount of, of worry about going into hospital but also some general practitioners um, surgeries put out letters telling uh, disabled people that they should think about do not resuscitate orders uh, or were actually very directly told if you get sick, you will not be treated. So for me, it's important to have the full range um, to, to, to actually understand how many disabled people are dying through this as well. We're not dispensable. Um, and a lot of disabled people may not get as far as hospital to, to get treatment. End of life treatment is something which is totally different decision. But if disabled people are denied access in the first place, that is really worrying. That's a really important point you raised, Baroness Grace Thompson, that, that, that actually how we prioritise care and how that, um, that attention of both the medical profession, but also social care is divvied up is an important one. And I want to talk about something you mentioned. If we could pull up that picture, um, that we have of the letter that was sent out in Wales, but is also known to have been sent out across the UK. Now, this letter was sent to residents who are extremely sick, and some of them were disabled. And it asks them to sign a do not resuscitate order to yeah. try and help out those, quote, who are younger uh, and fitter to mm. survive. As a disabled person yourself, and as a politician, how do you feel about these kinds of ways that authorities are trying to deal with the pandemic? Uh, I'm very grateful I'm not a doctor having to make some of these decisions because they will be the toughest decisions anyone outside a war zone will ever have to make. And, and that is really difficult to do. But as a disabled person, I worry about the perception of my quality of life, which I had somebody say to me not that long ago, well, haven't you thought about killing yourself loads of times because of, you know, being like you? Well, I was an athlete and I'm a parliamentarian. Actually, I thought my quality of life was OK. But the assumption uh, around disabled people is that we have no value. We can't contribute. Um, we're, we're just disposable. And this adds to that. And this, I is this is my fear. My worry is, uh, uh, Barris Gray Thompson, that actually by the authority sending out a letter like this, it legitimizes so much of that dangerous and very corrosive uh, viewpoint that actually, if we have to choose, people with disabilities should come last. So the fact that it's by the government, that it's by uh, uh, um, the authorities is, is my point of contention here. And as mm. a parliamentarian, I wonder what, what would you advise? How would you ask um, the House of Commons to react to something like this? Should we be sending out letters like this to vulnerable people, especially those within the disability community? No, because actually a lot of people wouldn't even suspect that they were in that vulnerable category because they might be disabled. I keep saying being disabled doesn't mean you're sick. Um, and those two are often confused and, and lumped in together. So there are difficult decisions to be taken, um, but those are better off done in in a, a kind of face to face, even if it's via technology, which which explores what people view their quality of life and what their prognosis is, not a letter coming. People were not expecting these letters to come through the door. They thought maybe other people were going to get them. Um, and that that's a, a real worry because, you know, disabled people just think 
they'll be lost. And one of the issues, um, and with this pandemic, it's horrible, but, you know, people aren't allowed family members in with them into hospital. And a lot of the time it's family members who are fighting for disabled people's rights because we're not even listened to at that point. So um, that that's a real fear from, from a lot of disabled people that they wouldn't have anybody standing up for them and, and what their quality of life is. I want to bring May Soon here at this point. I mean, you've had a lot of what um, Baroness Grace Thompson has to say. What do you make of this sort of letter, as you alluded to earlier? Well, I mean, it's not surprising. It's mainstream. There's no value for disabled lives worldwide. It's one of the things I've been fighting for. It's one of the reasons that I do stand-up comedy. Let's but be who <laughs> is it that doesn't value disabled? Who are we talking about? Let's be specific. Non-disabled people and a lot of disabled people that have been convinced their lives are not worth living. It's not just people who aren't disabled. There's a lot of people who are disabled and who have been taught they are a burden, their lives are not worth living. If you don't have capitalist potential, you shouldn't have quality of life. You know, we, we talk so much about people losing jobs and people being unemployed and wanting to get back to contributing to society. Well, I'm one of the people that thinks you don't need to contribute to society to have a life that's valuable. And that's not a popular opinion worldwide, that people who don't produce are valuable, that people who don't think and, and act like us are not valuable. I mean, they've done polls. You know, I'm a comedian, so I'm gonna lighten it up for a second here. But they've done polls and they said 80% of people wouldn't date a disabled person. And we know that 20% are disabled. So basically, no one wants to date us. Uh, people don't picture us when they're thinking of education, when they're thinking of jobs. You know, when I go into any sort of setting, it's usually not accessible. So you're dealing with a community that doesn't have value worldwide, that is more subjected to poverty, that makes them more vulnerable health-wise. And as, you know, Tani said, being disabled is not being sick. But being disabled is being discriminated against. In the best countries, we still face enormous amounts of violence and enormous amounts of discrimination. Um, I want to read a comment here very quickly from Sharif, who says, um, for those who think that we are depressed and sad and we don't have value and that we will never become anything, they need to come and see the heroes here. So that's to all of you who are joining us in a while. I'll come to you in a moment. Just a reminder for those of you who are asking us uh, to update you on what the debate is. Those of you who are watching us on Twitter, on uh, where else are you watching? YouTube, Facebook, I get confused. Thank you. Welcome to the debate and the discussion here at Dear World Live. I am joined by the wonderful Baroness Tani Gray Thompson, who is a Paralympic athlete and competed in five Paralympic Games, now sits in the House of Lord Maysoon Zaid, who is an actress, comedian, and disability rights activist, and Nawal Akram, a friend of the show and also a disability rights campaigner. We are discussing the issue of how the coronavirus pandemic is affecting the community of people with disabilities. Nawal, let me stay with you as our wonderful viewers are sending in their comments and questions and I'll be putting a lot more of them there. Thank you all for joining us. What do you make of a lot of what our guests have said so far? Do you have anything to add? Can, Noel, can you hear me? Noel, can you hear me? Yeah, it's good. No, okay. So my question to you is, you, I hope you've heard some of what mm -hmm. Baroness and uh, what Maysoon has said. What do you make of the conversation so far? Um, so far, you, the, the, one of the major things that uh, global powers around the world, that whether we like it or not, have influenced globally on opinions of how disabled people are viewed, right? Whether we like it or not, the UK and the States are considered global powers. And now, uh, during this pandemic, what I'm shifting the view of how disabled people are viewed, that is coming here too, because my Twitter, my direct messages, when I was arguing about regarding this matter and even my own educational matters that I'm talking about, they're like, okay, fine, but you are more vulnerable to die. So everything regarding education uh, around the Middle East is being delayed which is insane, even regarding all uh, at the moment. So essentially this uh, language from 
even the most progressive nations will essentially affect us, right? And it, it's insane how that is going because that is shifting people's mindsets uh, around us. So even people around me that I consider very close uh, are saying that, you know, they have to, we got to do what we got to do. And I'm like, like what? The, and basically, if well, I mean, disabled people gave a lot, right? We gave an education. We gave. We have people like Stephen Hawking, Frida Kahlo. These are amazing figures, even in right now in the pandemic. Or that is kind of keeping us sane, right? May soon. Are Did you have something to say? Yeah, I, I, I just, I, I love you so much. I have to push back on you and Sharif. It's exactly what I said. Um, we don't have to be super crips. We don't have to be me or Frida Kahlo or, you know, a Paralympian to have value. I don't want people to look at me and say other disabled people don't deserve to live or don't deserve help or don't deserve point. access because they're not Stephen Hawking and they maybe, you know, have severe Down syndrome. Like you don't have to be a Stephen Hawking to be worth saving. So it just, it always worries me. Even this was regarding, I this was regarding when people dad. bring in. <laughs> <laughs> this is bringing in that people, uh, the topic that people with disabilities don't contribute anything. Even we contribute or we don't, even we live normal lives, we matter, right? Yes. We have we don't have to put our lives in play for people to let us matter. But education does it. It normalizes us around society. We need right, to right. be normalized. Yeah. We're normalized through education, which is very important. I'm going to stop you there for just a moment because I'd like to get in some of the <laughs> questions and comments that have been coming in uh, from you guys who are watching us live here at Dear World Live. Uh, a question that came in that I saw yesterday from Helen uh, on Twitter, and, and it's more of a comment. And Helen says, um, to me, the biggest issue is food. I'm not vulnerable enough for priority online shopping slots but can't physically access a supermarket. I just want to feed my family. If I hear one more time that I could get a that I could get a volunteer or friend to do it, I'm going to lose it. We've got more questions coming in as well. Uh, I think there's there's one right here, um, and and I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure what uh, Radhika means, but but Radhika says, "Hello, ladies. I have a question. If you wish." Uh, cure our disabilities through an operation or something would that mean we are comforting uh, conforming to the hegemony of able bodiness and we had another one um from south africa here this is really pertinent i'm going to ask you all to comment on this jacques says hi from south africa how do we address challenges such as the picture that we saw earlier of the the, the gentleman in the wheelchair trying to wash his hands and unable to do so because of the position of where that tap was. How do we address challenges such as the picture you showed uh, when we face poverty uh, and lack of support everywhere in South Africa? So those are your questions. Please keep them coming in. I'll try and feature some more. If we can get everyone back up on the stream. Baroness uh, Grace Thompson, what do you make of that? Poverty impacts those living in the global north and in the glo global south. So you could talk about the dis disabled experience in the UK uh, of, a, of someone who's living in poverty and compare it anywhere else in the world? Yeah, I mean, comparatively disabled people are much more likely to be in poverty in the UK, um, you know, out of work, struggling to get work. You know, the, the employment gap is double that of non-disabled people. And, you know, one of the things I was lucky as an athlete that I got to travel the world a lot and see lots of other countries uh, and, how disabled people are treated there and you you look at the picture in south africa but you know that could be rwanda it could be so many other countries where disabled people don't even get the basic care i went i went to a girls orphanage in india a couple of years ago all the girls had polio and we talk about in the uk that being eradicated um they three girls had to share one wheelchair um so one got it for the morning one got it the afternoon one got it in the evening and then between times they kind of dragged themselves around you look at that and you just think that just shows in a much starker way the lack of support for disabled people. Um, and it's it's really scary when you see that in terms of, um, you know, just how you get people to think differently. And, you know, being a Paralympic, the Paralympics is not a cure for everything. Absolutely not. It's a great big sporting event. And I can probably say this because, you know, I'm, I'm slightly tired of every young disabled person being told, oh, you can be a Paralympian. 
You're actually going to be quite good at sport and you've got to train. Just because you're disabled, it doesn't get you a ticket to the Paralympics. It, it does have an ability to open people's eyes, but it's not going to fix the world's problems for disabled people on its own. That needs governments to, to, to think very differently about how it values um, people in society. And the trouble is, you know, the Churchill saying, which is the weakest in society, you know, that just then also just puts us back at the bottom of the pile again, which is, is not always helpful. Uh, let's bring everyone. Yes, Maysoon, yeah. I would never imagine to stop you from <laughs> no, having sorry. Just, Please. Uh, yeah, just a, I was thinking of Radhika's question, honestly, about whether to cure or not to cure. And uh, I think it's a personal choice. I think it's a personal choice. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a miracle cure. I wouldn't take the pill. I wouldn't get the surgeries. I do yoga. I try to live my best life, but I wouldn't want a cure because having CP is part of who I am. It's part of my character, but I support any disabled person who does want to have a cure. And as for the accessibility question, it's a really difficult question because it is a worldwide problem. In the United States of America, people in Michigan are having their water turned off. So they can't even wash their hands because they have no water. In Palestine, they're being denied access to actual food. So when you're a Palestinian person and you're in a war zone and you're disabled and you're battling a pandemic, it's a nightmare. And when you're in Michigan and you're in the United States and you can't wash your hands or go to the bathroom in a hygienic way, it's a nightmare. So I think that worldwide, worldwide, the disability community needs to come together and get the Convention on the Rights of Disabled People signed, finally. Okay, let's bring everyone back into the conversation. I want to focus on solutions. Uh, as ever, Doha Debates, Dear World Live, we want to talk about and focus on ways to have conversations about solutions rather than just problems. And here, I just want to, um, can we throw up that amazing picture we found over the week? Okay, so this is one of my favorite images of the week. It shows a medical professional, maybe someone who works um, in care in the community, wearing a mask that has a transparent bit where people who have difficulty hearing or are deaf are able to uh, communicate and talk mm -hmm. to professionals um, in a way. So it, it's just a very easy solution to a very big problem when you're, when you're, when you're adding mm -hmm. coronavirus to the issue of um, people living with disabilities. And it's just one way we can correct, we can remove a barrier that's in place. Um, a friend of the show, Dr. Uh, Victor Pineda, who's already commented a few times, said the problem is very rarely with people with disabilities the problem are the barriers so i want to talk about that for a minute you can tell me about innovative ways or, or just normal ways that you've had to adjust to life uh with covid should we go in, in a bit of a round robin and have a discussion about it? who wants to start us off oh i'll go go uh, the so life is star wars light and dark and the upside is all of the accommodations that disabled people asked for that everybody pretended were super expensive, technologically impossible, and just no way, Jose, have now been implemented overnight. So when we said, can we please do learning remotely? They said, no. We said doctor's appointments, they said, no. Lectures, they said, no. And now suddenly we can do it all. And technology is racing forward and that is a huge, positive for disabled people. For me as a comedian, the biggest <laughs> challenge has been doing stand-up comedy with no one to laugh at me. I don't think I've actually made the adjustment. I'm oh. trying really, really hard, but I'm Tinkerbell from Peter Pan and I die without applause. So <laughs> it's been a huge adjustment. Oh, look, <laughs> I'm thriving, <laughs> Ramadan <laughs> Kareem. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, all of that makes absolute sense and and we will find a way to get you an audience maybe. <laughs> yeah. Noel, what about you how are you solving um, it through this difficult time with the coronavirus all right so there's different things right um the thing is you have people's attention right now wait can you hear me i can wave if you can um so um, basically, basically, one of the things that's going on right now is that because we have people's attention on social media, so any campaigning, any topic we're trying to bring up, people are there. They're on their phones. They're sitting. They're able to read it. They're able to look at it. Um, 
so that's the good part, right? I have people's attention. Like as a comedian, we love that. But even as an activist, <laughs> we really need that. <laughs> but even as an activist, we really need that, right? It's also um, at the same time you deal with people trying to explain to you that oh no this is a practical solution i'm like if i said this about you what how would you feel so very good point but we have a lot of time to okay let's just speak sorry, <laughs> sorry to interrupt i'm just aware of the time i'd like to bring in baroness gray thompson you were just nodding vigorously um, when maysoon was talking and giggling a little bit what what what, what was funny what made you laugh about that so technology, absolutely right. Disabled people have been asking for this for years and it's like, oh, we can't do it. The House of Lords, which dates back to the 11th century, or if you've been really picky, two distinct chambers in the 14th century, I never thought would go online. I was in a fully online debate today where we're all sitting around the country. And you're thinking, if you can do that with the oldest institution in the world, the mother of parliament, we can do this elsewhere. Um, and, you know, Austin Noir was right about social media. Social media is really important to get disabled people's stories out there. And um, what I've learned through this time, I've connected to more and more disabled people. We're, we're supporting each other, you know, tweeting other sort of stories and experiences. And for me, I tweet a lot about trains and how bad they are in the UK for disabled people. Um, and what's happened is non-disabled people are now realizing the experience we have and they're stepping in they're not taking over disabled people's decision making they're not you know but they're they see it and they're calling it out as well and that's when things will change is when other people see our experiences um and recognize that we don't have a quality just because we're on telly a few times a year um it, it's not true and you know i guess we'll get to the point when i call it lots of people call it cripping up when we get to the point where we have disabled people represented across films lots of other things we don't see non-disabled people pretending to be disabled that's when we know we've made it yeah we have a global goal for 50 percent representation of women and i think we need a global goal um, of 20 percent disabled in leadership in media in every walk of life You've got full agreement here on, on, on our stream here at Dear World Life. Thank you to all of those who are joining us and watching. We are so thrilled to have you. Send me your comments and questions. I've been featuring as many as I can with our wonderful guests so far. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left, maybe just a little bit less. Maysoon, I want to come to you directly. Uh, you have a charity based in the West Bank and in Gaza, and there is a big difference in the experience of people with disabilities in the developing world or the global south and those in the global north. What are you hearing on the ground in Gaza and the West Bank? How are people experiencing life uh, under with COVID-19? So um, in 2012, I did have to close down my charity because my touring became so aggressive. I didn't have time to personally run a charity. So instead, I work with two organizations, UNRWA, the UN Refugee Work something, UNRWA, I'm so embarrassed, I blame pandemic brain, and, play, <laughs> and Playgrounds for Palestine. And I'll, I'll speak from the angle of Playgrounds for Palestine because Playgrounds for Palestine was all about exporting olive oil and building accessible and fun playgrounds for kids in Palestine that didn't have access to, to play. They've had to shift their work to direct financial aid to families on the ground because in a place where you have such high unemployment, you have such limited access to medicine, to food, to water, to electricity, when you add a pandemic on, it really becomes untenable. Mm. Um, but I'm really proud of the Palestinian community. They're certainly doing better than the American community. They shut down the churches, they shut down the mosques, people are sheltering in place, they're being very careful. It's amazing to see a society that was once forced under curfew by the oppression and occupation of the Israeli army to choose to stay indoors for their own health and their own safety. And it's proof that that myth that we don't value life is false. And it also shows you what dire, dire straits the United States is in. Because while we got people to agree not to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Palestine, we can't get people to stop going to churches here in America and people are dying as a result. So I'm pretty proud of the Palestinians but they are in dire straits. They have been cut off 
completely of aid from the United States and they really need help. And anyone who can give at this time, please give what you can. Uh, Baroness Grey Thompson, you obviously sit in the upper house, in the House of Lords in the United Kingdom, um, and you have some influence and some effect on, on and, and you are hold the government, in essence, um, accountable for, for, for what they present and what they want to bring in as law. A lot mm -hmm. has been done to try and provide financial help and assistance to various groups within the community. Uh, whether they're small businesses or whether they're people who are unemployed or those who, who need uh, better welfare care. What are you hoping will be done for the rights and for, for, for disabled people, for, the, for people with disabilities? And, and what are you championing? What are you hoping to, to, to get out of the House of Commons and the politicians? Um, we have a, a benefit called Universal Credit in the UK. And, you know, it's it doesn't pay people a lot of money. It's under £100 a week. Um, and a lot of the discussion before this was about, well, of course you can live on that. That's really, you know, easy to do. Um, and now that there's very sadly a significant number of people who are losing their jobs, they're applying for benefit, they're trying to get support. They realise some of their views on what you can afford to live on in the UK is um, not not the same as they think it is. Um, I, I think it's highlighted some of the issues in some of the benefit systems not working, um, and, and we need to, to redo that. I mean. For me, Corona's been the double whammy. We had Brexit leaving the European Union and we've got this. Um, and, and it's not what we need right now. But I'm hoping when we come out of it, there'll, there'll be more understanding of disability rights, the challenges disabled people face, um, and, and thinking a bit differently. You know, when the UK wants to, the coronavirus bill was 392 pages they put through in three days. When the government wants to do something, and this is any government, not just this government, when they want to do something, they can do it. We need that kind of speed of action um, in future. And our disability legislation is way out of date uh, and, and seriously needs looking at. There are opportunities abound for positive change. And on that note, I'd like to bring up all of my guests because I have one final question to ask you. In the beginning of this stream of Dear Wildlife, I asked what we allies, those of us who want to make a positive impact, what can we do? to try and change things for the better when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic and the community of people with disabilities. I wanna go round in a sense and see what you guys have to say. What can we all do to make a little bit of a difference um, for the good? Uh, Baroness Grey Thompson, let's just start with you. I think we have to keep challenging. We keep have to challenge in government, local authorities, people who are making decisions on behalf of disabled people. Um, not everyone will have the same strength of voice all the time. And people, you know, it's it's really tough on a lot of disabled people right now. But, you know, we all have to take strength from each other and, and keep calling out how disabled people are being treated. soon, you're next. Uh, listen to disabled adults, especially if you are the parent of a disabled child. Listen to disabled adults. We've lived it. We know what we're talking about. Value disabled life equally to non-disabled life. Stop saying silly stuff like you'd rather be dead than disabled. And when fighting for civil rights, when fighting for equality, fight for disability rights. They are human rights and we need everybody's help right now. Nawal, you get the last word. Okay, first is that people don't need to be disabled to champion disabled rights. You don't need to be disabled to do it. Anyone can champion disabled rights. Read your laws, be aware of your laws, your legislation, what is going on recently. Everyone should be aware of it. And a second part, like can society stop putting new barriers for disabled people as a disabled woman in the middle? Like I'm, uh, you know, I'm of the Pakistani origin, I'm born in Doha. And one of the biggest issues I face that whenever I go for employment, I go for any issues. Okay, I don't have education, but then, oh, we should give this to uh, someone that's male and disabled instead of female and disabled. And that is a ba that is a new barrier that society creates. So stop putting new barriers of nationality and disability and culture. These are new barriers society puts up. We solve one issue, we create another. Uh, this is my last comment. You don't need to be disabled to make awareness and stop putting on new barriers for us. Yeah. So that's it. Baroness Tani Gray Thompson, Maysin Zaid, Nawal Akram, thank you so much for joining me for this stream of Dear Wildlife. I'm grateful for your time. Wave goodbye. That's it. Thank from you me. so much. Bye. 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 Bye.
Robert, yeah. <laughs> goodbye, guys. Okay, so thank you, our wonderful audience from around the world. I counted at least four continents you're all watching us on. I am so thankful for your time. I hope you found this conversation illuminating and you took something with it. Remember, we are everywhere. You can keep going and keep watching us. Um, we have an amazing Instagram account with a hashtag solving it series that we put out. Also, if you've got lots of quarantine spare time, why not listen to my podcast, Course Correction? That is dropping a, a new episode every Wednesday and there's a brand new one that's coming out tomorrow and you can binge listen to the 15 episodes that are there already. You can just search for Course Correction wherever you get the podcast. If you wanna be on the next show of Dear World Live, it's very easy for you to do so. Get in touch with us, we are connect at dohadebates.com, connect at dohadebates.com. There it is, that wonderful little banner there. So it's only uh, just enough time for me to tell you that we will be back next week at the same time. And this time we will be discussing the impact of the coronavirus pandemic and the climate crisis. Join me next week. I'll see you then. Bye.